Welcome back to the second part of the lecture of business and labor in the industrial era or the 40 years after the Civil War. One aspect that you may not have thought of when we're looking at innovations is office technology. Now this is a photo of typists in an office using the newly developed typewriter. And why is this so important? Well, with the rise of big business, you now start having headquarters, you have to have people to process orders, and you have people doing personnel work, payroll, buying supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So this led to a major new element of the workforce which were not just secretaries, typists, but often uh, the managers, both low-level and mid-level managers. One thing that's interesting looking at this photograph, you see all the women are wearing hats. And first thing I notice is how straight everybody is sitting. My, they're certainly sitting well. And the supervisors are in the back. You can see two men. Now this is the mundane paperclip. Well, they have many, many thousands of pages of documents being produced now in these new factories and businesses. And the paperclip, you may think is funny, but that was a major innovation in organizing the papers and keeping some together. Another, of course, was the stapler. Uh, this is a photograph of a modern stapler, but uh, it helped keep the papers organized. <coughs> this is one of the early typewriters. Um, most of my students being uh, around 20 years old have probably never used one, perhaps have seen one in a museum. And it works, obviously, when you press the key, it mechanically pushes the lever up to strike the ribbon. And the ribbon is in a spool and it goes from side to side. This invention, I mean, it was also invented simultaneously, various versions of it in Europe, in the United States, it was one of the major, major breakthroughs in communication. And I remember when I went off to college, I had a typewriter a little more modern than this. It was mechanical. Um, only one kid in the dorm had an electric typewriter. So we all had mechanical typewriters and you would have to, to punch it like that. And there were all kinds of students who would advertise to type your papers for a dollar a page because, of course, it was very difficult to, to uh, correct a uh, mistake you made typing, and we were required in college to turn in perfect papers. So it was usually worth it for, to pay someone to produce the final product for a dollar a page. Now look at the keyboard of that. You'll see it's just like your modern com computer keyboard, the letters Q, W, E, R, T, Y, etc. So the third row from the bottom. This is a modern keyboard and a computer, and it still has the QWERTY keyboard, Q, W, E, R, T, Y. That was developed precisely for two reasons. They did scientific studies of the letters most often used in typing English. And the Q, I don't know about you, but I very seldom type it. And you know, when you're touch typing, you have to use the little finger in your left hand and kind of, frankly, every time I type a Q, I have to kind of look to make sure it's there because I don't use it. And you know, the E is widely used, the I, the R is, et cetera. And they're put there and they did studies of hand motion. Also, the typewriter I showed you a moment ago, the mechanical one, the levers had to go up and come back. And if they had the levers, they had to space them just right because they would often hit 
and get jammed and you have to reach up and pull them down. So the QWERTY keyboard is a legacy and we still have it at this time. But the only place I've, on my Blackberry, I don't have a Blackberry anymore, when I used to have one, it had a standard ABC layout and it was difficult to figure out at first where the letters were. Uh, this is the iPhone keyboard, which is the same as uh, the one I just showed you in the last slide, the Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Now this was an age that prided itself on being scientific. Management was scientific, so they had scientific management theories. And part of this was in manufacturing, they timed each step of a process. So the new scientific managers would go into factories, offices, wherever, literally with a stopwatch. And for instance, look at how long it takes for people to move the steps in the process. They went on to trains, and at this time the trains used coal, and some poor fellow was a tough job. The, the fireman was his name. He had to take a shovel and shovel snow, uh, not snow, <laughs> coal from the big box of coal, turn around and put it in the engine compartment uh, in the boiler. And they went out and they found that by, by holding the shovel slightly differently and moving slightly differently, he could speed up his productivity. So people prided themselves on using science and viewed themselves as very, very modern. A major development was that of interchangeable parts. Uh, this process started a little before the Civil War. And it was a major development because previously craftsmen would produce, for instance, each individual gun. But then if an army's out in the field and the gun doesn't work, well, they had to get a new gun, but then they came with parts that are interchangeable. So if you, if the gun didn't work, well, they could quickly look and see, oh, it's a bad spring. And they had a box and had some extra springs and put them in. Could, you know, our cars, everything is interchangeable in terms of, you know, you need a new oil filter, you go and it uses, you know, filter X, Y, Z, and you get a new one. And in fact, there's a federal law that requires manufacturers of cars to keep an inventory of all the parts for a certain number of years. So people uh, can always find parts. The assembly line, it was actually based on the slaughterhouses where animals were killed and then they were cut up um, into to meat products. And the early people looked at those and the animals were hung up on like a chain that went down and men would, would cut different sections or whatnot. And the first ones were for bicycles. Uh, the Colt company made revolvers. And then of course, Henry Ford did not actually invent the assembly line that had been used before, but he was the one who put it in the most popular use. And, you know, with men on both sides of the assembly line, cars would come down and, you know, someone's job all day might be just put three screws in. Corporations were set up as a legal entity. And obviously corporations are very important today. And from a legal viewpoint, the most important thing of a corporation is its uh, legal liability. It's limited in certain aspects. Many corporations sell stock. We talked about earlier the need for the railroads to set up corporations to, to raise stock. But the corporation is a form, uh, a legal form for a company. People can have corporation just themselves or with two people. And this greatly assisted the expansion of business. And the emphasis was on efficiency, productivity, and improving the productivity of both workers and the productivity of capital. Capital is the investment. And large-scale industrial enterprises 
were really encouraged by all the economists at the time and the business managers because of economy as a scale. What does that mean? Well, if you're going to make some product in a factory, it's per product, it's obviously cheaper to make a thousand than a hundred because of the large fixed costs in setting up the machinery and the assembly lines and whatnot. So the entire focus became large industrial enterprises. Steel was a key, key component um, in this industrial era. Steel is much better than iron. Iron rusts and steel is also uh, stronger than iron and it has a certain amount of flexibility which makes it perfect for railroad tracks because when a heavy train goes across at high speed on a railroad track you need a little flexibility in those uh, rails and the same thing when building tall skyscrapers with a, a steel framework or the steel structure you need a little flexibility there. You don't want it too, too rigid. Um, so the Bessemer process was a new process to manufacture steel. Um, this is a photograph of a modern steel plant with the uh, very high temperature process, the Bessemer process used to produce steel. In contrast, this is a photograph from around 1900 of a steel factory and you can see there it, there's a lot of smoke there but you can see a train has come in from the left a small train uh, pushing the, the, the large large uh, pieces of iron which chemicals are added to to make steel you can see the men there at this period of time there was virtually no worker protection. People were breathing the fumes, some of which may have been toxic, no hard hats or whatever. And these are not skilled workers. And we'll see in a minute when we start talking about um, worker rights and worker safety. Unfortunately, a certain number of workers would be injured or perhaps killed in factories like this. And they were easily replaceable because they were not particularly skilled and there were many, many people who wanted to work. Now, a major technological innovation, which you probably don't think of as an innovation, was the elevator invented by Mr. Otis. Next time you go into a building with an elevator, whether it's an apartment building you live in or a store or uh, doctor's office. Look at the sign on the elevator. It's almost certainly made by the Otis company which in, invented it. Before the elevator, no one built really high buildings because it's too tedious to walk up and down. I mean, who wanted to carry furniture up and down? Who wanted to go up and down themselves? And similarly for moving freight up and down in warehouses. So Mr. Otis recognized this need. So he wanted to develop an elevator that was safe, the so-called safety elevator. There were some early elevators in warehouses that carried products. And the problem is the rope or cable sometimes broke. There was a malfunction and it went crashing down. Well, there was no person inside or underneath uh, there was obviously no loss of life, but Otis wanted to build a passenger elevator. So what he did is he built this, this is an actual drawing from the time. He gave demonstrations. He went out himself and here he has the elevator up like 40, 50 feet in the air and it's held up by a rope and he calls out to his assistant, cut the rope. Well, the assistant cuts the rope. Everybody gasps and says, oh no and the elevator falls like two feet and there's an automatic safety brake on the side, which I'll show you in the next slide. And as they always say, seen as believing, people saw this and the Otis company couldn't manufacture enough elevators after people saw these demonstrations. This is 
the early Otis elevator. This is the, and you can see, you know, here they've cut the rope. This is a demonstration. You can see on the right and left side, the rails, and they have like ratchets. So if the elevator rope is cut or breaks or whatever, the elevator only goes down a few inches and it's automatically stopped. Uh, this is a recreation, a modern day recreation from the Otis Elevator Company at their annual meeting where they had someone dress up as Mr. Otis and they did the, the same thing. And here we also, we have the first time, um, you know, these are early press coverage of the elevator. Again, something we take for granted today. I mean, whoever thinks twice about an elevator, you get in. But thanks to Mr. Otis, um, the elevator is not supposed to fall more than about two inches. Okay, this, this concludes part two. And then we'll move on um, in the last part three of the lecture to look at, at some of the labor issues. Thank you.